Welcome, everybody. We are at the start of this week's session of NetDevOps Live. Once again, my name is Hank Preston. I'm one of the developer advocates and engineers in DevNet. And joining today on week uh, Season 1 Talk 12 is Casey Bleeker. Casey, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks? Thanks, Hank. Uh, my name is Casey Bleeker, and uh, I'm also with uh, Team DevNet. I have been a dev advocate on our IoT and AIML technologies at Cisco for the last few years, as well as now um, helping with our business development uh, of our ecosystem and ISV technology partners as well. Excellent, thanks. And I asked Casey to join me today because the topic we're going after is machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is a, a huge topic, I think, everywhere in IT these days. And it's, it's not something that I'm super familiar with, but I knew Casey had some background. And so today's session of NetDevOps Live is going to be a bit different than some of the ones we've done in the past, where this is going to be a bit more of an interview style, where I've piled up a handful of questions that have hopefully uh, kind of aligned with the types of questions you might have around this topic as well. And we're going to kind of dive through this topic as we go through. In fact, I've broken down kind of the types of things we're going to talk about into three sections. Uh, we're going to start off kind of a good chunk of our time today. Uh, tonight's going to be spent on what exactly is machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence? What do these words actually mean? How do they relate to each other? How do they relate to some of the other technologies out in IT, both older technologies as well as some of the other kind of hype and buzzword ones that we've got? And then we're going to move into kind of where does Cisco fit into machine learning and artificial intelligence? Uh, what is some of the work we're doing kind of in the background? How are we using them in our products? Uh, what does it relate kind of to your interface with some of the Cisco tools that are out there? And then finally, as we end, we'll kind of ask some of the questions about how does machine learning and artificial intelligence fit into our jobs as network engineers or infrastructure engineers? And, and what should we be thinking about? What should we, uh, what should we be looking at? How deep should we go? all of those pieces. So lots of good kind of fodder for us to go into. And so without further ado, we're going to jump right into this initial part of the conversation with kind of some of these hard questions uh, that I went through. Got a little ahead in the slides. Some of the, the hard questions that started off. And so I'm going to stop sharing the slides actually because we're going to spend a lot of our time just in this dialogue piece as we go through. And so Casey, let's start at the beginning can you help me understand what is artificial intelligence and and don't throw buzzwords at me or references to terminator and these other pieces right break it down in simple human terms like what do i need to know how do i understand what exactly is this artificial intelligence kind of practical types of discussions you know when when we talk about when about artificial intelligence really like you know whether it's a data scientist or in pop culture or somebody who's who's uh, you know in, in IT or tech like we are, um, what we really mean by artificial intelligence is when we imbue a machine or give a machine human characteristics. And so you know this is something that we've been trying to do for 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 forever since we've had computers. Even in the fifties, we had people trying to code machines that could play chess. Right? It was it was thought that chess was a strategic game, and being able to make those strategic decisions was characteristically human. Um, today we might characterize something that is characteristically human as something like being able to infer something. And what do I mean by infer? Well, it's, it's what we've all done since children. It's, it's when I get data coming into my environment that I can make some rationalization or decision about it that isn't always 100% right. A good example of that might be pictures of cats or dogs. If, I, if you show me a picture of, of two animals, I should be able to tell you, is that a cat or is that a dog? And that's very characteristically human to be able to infer some data about that. And I might not always be right because you might show me a, a four-year-old a picture of a chihuahua and a, and a mountain lion, and they might call the mountain lion a dog and the chihuahua a cat, right? So you, you, there's you're, the, the human intelligence, that, that artificial intelligence, is exactly that. It's the ability to make mistakes, but also to do something that is rationalizing or, or applying massive amounts of data to come to some easier to consume outcome or, or understanding. And really, it's, it's something that we would call characteristically human. Okay, so, so artificial intelligence is just trying to replicate some element of, of human nature, human thought process. Now, when we think about artificial intelligence, is it, is it full-on intelligence? Is it full-on replicating a human being? Or is it, I mean, what what's far enough down this path? Is it simply like figuring out what's a cat and what's a dog? Or do you have to pull all these things together to count? You know, I, I think that it's really just, it's something that we would say is is not 
inherently logic, right? It's not just something that an if-else statement. It's something that is more characteristic of, of human intelligence. So it might be making a prediction in the future. And, mm -hmm. and I think you brought up a good point though, is that artificial intelligence is really a broad term. And it really just means human-like, right? And I think that's gonna change over time because what was human-like in the 1950s was when you could program a computer to, to not just play a game of chess, but maybe win one of a hundred, right? Now we consider artificial intelligence to be people being able to play, you know, Fortnite. You know, artificial intelligence is playing Fortnite or some of the latest video games and winning, right? Um, and and so I think that, that that definition is going to evolve, but it's really it's it's whatever we would say is is definitively human. Um, what's interesting about that though is we've been having to do that for a long time, right? So since the 50s, we've been trying to to program machines to be human-like, and it's been it takes a lot of work. So I think that 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 evolution that that definition is going to evolve. Okay, so so artificial intelligence is just simply the act of trying to replicate some element of human nature in code. That makes sense. So. What's machine learning? It seems to always be tied in with artificial intelligence. How tightly coupled is it? But but what is machine learning on its own before we kind of relate it into to AI? Yeah, absolutely. So so machine learning is when we we uh, get the output of a machine of a of a of a program without explicitly programming it to do some action. What do I mean by that? Well, really, it just means that I have some task I want some machine to to do, but I'm not going to explicitly program it to do that. A good example might be a, um, a, a robot vacuum, right? I want it, the task I want it to do is go vacuum my whole living room. Well, if I explicitly code it to go from coordinate to coordinate to coordinate to coordinate to coordinate, that's just code, that's just our logic, right? But if I say, why don't you go wander and, and actually find something that's, that's, that's um, dirty or, or make it some evaluation from your environment and choose how to best clean the, the environment, but I didn't explicitly code it to do that. I said, here's the inputs and the outputs that I want. Then, then I'm not having to code that. Maybe even a, a better example is if we go back to our example of cats and dogs. If I think about those pictures of cats and dogs, what would I have to code to differentiate pictures of cats and dogs? I'd have to write an algorithm and a function that would ingest all of the data, the bits and pixels from each image and maybe I'd look for the color of the dog. Is the dog brown? Is the, is the animal orange and maybe it's a cat? Um, does it have different patterns in the fur or in the, in the hair? What are the shape of the ears and the eyes? And, and, and that's great, but it might take me hundreds of thousands of lines of code to explicitly write a program that can differentiate cats and dogs. Machine learning is literally educating a machine. It's, it's teaching a machine by saying, Here's all the input data you might see. Just like a child sees a cat or a dog, and we reinforce that learning. When they look at a dog and they say dog, we say, yeah, that's a good, good, good job, right? If they point at a dog and say kitty, we say no, that's wrong, right? And so what we do is machine learning is literally this black box where we don't explicitly write the code, we let it evolve, and as it gets more accurate, we, we feed it more data. And so we can actually check the accuracy of it. And if it's not accurate, we try a whole different schema. And so there's all these frameworks to basically evolve that algorithm. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in this training context of building this mm -hmm. black box. But really machine learning is just saying, we're gonna use some frameworks that allow us to not have to explicitly code the, for the outcome or the task that we want our algorithm or our, or, or our, our application to complete. Sure, but it, so somebody had to build the black box, right? So where do these where do these initial frameworks come from? Uh, do you have to have one that's kind of tuned for your type of work that you're after, or are these kind of generic purposed black boxes that I can grab off the shelf? That's a great question. So you know, I, I, it it kind of depends on your on your your use case, and this is obviously where I think a lot of the the education and experience that data scientists have, or and 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 their training comes in. But really, it started with, I mean, machine learning has also been around since the early 50s because it's really about iteration. It's about how many times and can I evolve that program. And as compute power has gone up, 
the number of evolutions that we can make. The, the, I can try a billion different transformations of random code, and one of them will actually have the result that I want of predicting the outputs I want. But there's all these frameworks to iterate that code and generate those random, what we call neural networks, to, to generate that random kind of fitment of seeing how well it can match or predict the, the output that we want that, to, that, that algorithm to have. These frameworks are, are all now open sourced by a lot of the major players. You've got things like TensorFlow from Google, Cafe and Theano, Theano uh, very, very much backed by like Facebook. Um, and you have some of the, the open source uh, math kind of based implementations from academia like PyTorch or, or Scilib. So there's a lot of these open source frameworks and those tools are basically the, what create that back black box for us of, of matching those inputs to, to basically create that code happening inside of the machine learning a, a algorithm for us, what we call a trained model. Sure. So let's see. So I've got so machine learning then is is kind of taking away the the specific and the kind of the the very um, small bits of coding that we would have to do. It's kind of building something or consuming something that somebody else wrote, and then kind of evolving some knowledge around it with training. And we're, we're going to dive into training a little bit, but but bringing back together, we always hear ML, AI, or machine learning, artificial intelligence together. How, how do these two things relate? Uh, are, they, are they separate? Do they have to come together? I mean, how does, how does machine learning and artificial intelligence connect together? Yeah, so I mean, it turns out that machine learning is all about showing data to this kind of algorithm or this framework, and then having it predict or, or develop some output. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's very similar to human behavior where we create these kind of, we don't really, I couldn't tell you how my brain is wired, right? I don't know the code that causes which neuron to fire versus which way when I see a cat or a dog. But my brain has created a, a random uh, kind of association that results in the output that I have been trained to do. So that's kind of a good example for machine learning where machine learning kind of mimics this biology of the human brain where I show these inputs I have all these kind of random assortment of, of things that happen that I don't have a real good visibility into, and then I get the output that I want. So it turns out that this ability to kind of be trained mimics the way human brains are trained, which means we can start using those kinds of things for things like prediction. I couldn't really code a machine to predict when something's going to happen, but if there's data or trends or information that a human might be able to infer that data from, then I could actually start to train a machine learning model. I have tons of data coming in the format of voice or video or audio and images and real-time video analysis, um, which is driving things like self-driving cars. And so this, these types of analysis definitely happen quite a bit. Um, now, uh, so if, if we're talking about things like, you know, that's, that's really where machine learning starts to drive these, these human-like behaviors because now you take this, this idea of taking pictures, but you say, how can I actually find hundreds of objects? And it's not just saying, is it a cat or a dog? But it's saying, what is that object of millions of types of objects? And so now we get into what we, we, we really look at, like a, a, a training problem or, or a feature and classification problem. And so, and so let's... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so let's go into that a little bit. So, so if I understand this right, when I start out with machine learning, I've got some goal in mind. I want to teach it to identify cats versus dogs or, or whatever the use case is. We start out with an empty child of code, right? It's, it's, we have our black box, we've picked our library that we're going to use, and we have to train it. So how, how does that work? Can you talk us through some of the, the training mechanisms and, and what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So it kind of comes down to, to two areas that we want to cover first. And the first are features. Um, and, and features are what we feed the black box, right? It's all the data we know. So if we look at like pictures of cats and dogs, the raw binary data of those images is the, is the, are the features. And as you get into data science and get into machine learning, you, you know, there's, there's all these complex fields of, of feature extraction and, and how we can maybe outline certain gradients or, or maybe we colorize the images so that before we feed it to the black box, we do some processing so that it can actually kind of get more data from our, our, our images or, or the different data sources we have. But that's all kind of the, the data science side. But what we really care about, in fact, is that once we feed that data to the black box, it also needs to then train that model 
based on what we call labels. So it's building this whole thing and then it's gonna spit out a prediction. Well, it needs to actually check, is that prediction right? So the data set that we gave it has to be labeled. We actually have to tell it, when I give you this binary image, is it a cat or a dog? So that as you build this network, this, 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 this uh, trained model, it can actually go back and validate and test its own algorithm and say, I did predict it was a dog when you showed me that image and it actually was a dog. So it can start to check how accurate it is by actually feeding its own data into itself, checking to say, hey, that was a dog and I predicted it was a dog, so I'm getting accurate. And that's how it starts to evolve itself is because it's a, 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 a labeled data set. And this kind of leads into a, a, a separate kind of conversation about classification. And I've actually just got a little graphic here I'll share. Um, so go ahead and share my screen. So if we look at the labels that a data set might have, right? We had cats or dogs, or we, in this case, this is a, a, a graphic of cancer data, of tumor data. And on the x-axis, we actually have the size of the, of the tumor. And on the y-axis, we actually have the color of the tumor. And so what we can see is, is when we think about a tumor, it's, it's either cancerous or it's not, right? And we don't have such a thing as 2.6% cancerous, right? It's either cancerous or it's not. We only have two buckets. And that means that our, our label, the outcome of what we want to predict of a, about a tumor is actually discrete. There are a discrete number of, of outcomes that can be predicted by that data. And so that really is what we call a classification problem. When we show our model, the size of the tumor and the color of the tumor and any other data we have about that tumor, we want the model to predict the output Predicting the output is what we call inference. And when we, mm -hmm. when we infer or predict that output, it's gonna put it into one of two buckets, either cancerous or benign. And in this case, we can see we've drawn a line through that plot. Well, that line is actually our trained model. That's our algorithm. It positioned a line through our field of data that gave us the most accurate result, the lowest amount of loss and optimized our loss function. Loss is basically just how accurate is that line going through our data. So we fed it, or, or we feed an algorithm these features. It places this line through our data, and now when we get new features that aren't labeled, I want to predict or infer something about it, I can actually make an, a, a, an educated guess using that machine learning model of is this tumor cancerous or benign? Now, you might think that seems pretty simple because we've been doing this for, for decades, almost centuries in terms of fitting lines to data. Well, if we think about this when the labels are continuous, where I might have like, here's a graph of housing prices. So as the size of a house goes up, the price of the house goes up. And we can see how that iteration happens where the machine learning algorithm starts with a line down low and it just starts slowly adjusting its position and pitch to get more accurate. And the lower the loss, the more it keeps iterating that line. And so it's really just fitting that line. Well, that's exactly how Excel fits a line to our data, right? Well, what if I have not just the size of the house, but how far back from the house, it's, uh, the street it's set back, or the color of the roof, or how recently it was painted, or how many days on the market it's been. Suddenly I don't just have one dimension, I have five, 10, 15, or 20. And you can see how if I have even maybe just two extra dimensions about a house, days on the market and size, uh, and trying to predict its, its price, I now have this three-dimensional cloud of data. And as humans, we really struggle to, to visualize data beyond three dimensions because we live in three dimensions, right? And machines, though, can think about data in four, five, six, a thousand dimensions and if we were to fit a line through this cloud of data, it wouldn't just be a line anymore, it would be a plane. It'd be a two-dimensional surface flowing through this cloud of data. And it would not just take 30 iterations like on the left, it would take something on the order of thousands of iterations to find what line or slope of, of, of a plane fits best through that cloud of data. And that's only with three dimensions. You can imagine with thousands of dimensions of data, 
I now have to fit a line or a surface that is maybe a five or six or 10 dimension surface flowing through that cloud of data. And it seems to pretty abstract, but you can simplify it back to the idea that at its core, when we iterate these algorithms, we're really iterating line fitting. We're fitting a, a, a model or an algorithm that best fits our shape of our data. And that's really what iteration comes down to. So let me let me see if I if I've understood that correctly. And so before I got into IT, um, I actually started out in psychology. So I, I went to school, and, and part of my psychology work was doing statistics and looking at like data sets from different studies and understanding and trying to to deduce patterns and go through. And it sounds like that's really what machine learning is: is it's it's looking at a set of data and then figuring out what what are the statistics, what are the the clustering, what are the patterns, what are the pieces that are in there. And so that it can it can make educated guesses or, or ex extrapolate or, or infer to use the words that we've been using here where the pieces go through, and so that that piece makes sense to me is this idea that we've got a bunch of data and if we were doing this in the old school way it would kind of go in front of people or data scientists and they would evaluate and they would look at the different kind of factors or or variables that are being tweaked and figure out kind of what is the one piece of information we're interested in, and so that type of a relation to it does kind of settles in and I understand that piece. And it's just this, this idea of trying to figure out how do we find the patterns and how do we go through on that. Um, the statistic piece of this, I, I think that's the area that's getting me that's interested in here is, is when we start to talk about the scale of data that's in mind. If I'm dealing with two or three different variables and a thousand patients in a study, I, we can probably figure that out by hand. But if we've got dozens of factors in all of these areas, it seems like that's where, where the, the sweet spot for machine learning might kick yeah. in. Well, and, and as we get a little further into to our conversation, you'll see that machine learning is using some of these frameworks where it's just a couple lines. A lot of it is actually preparing the data, getting the data extracted, doing some basic data science, really the statistics, the statisticians of mm -hmm. what kind of data is relevant, what, is, what are the models, you know? You, we do look at things like the standard deviation or bell curves of these data and the distributions and the histograms of, of those data types to see what actually correlates, what is actually um, uh, relevant to these data sets. And it, it, as you get into machine learning and as data scientists, most of what they're using from a programming perspective are stat statistics libraries and, and, and basic math libraries before they get to the machine learning stage. And it's almost, a lot of people are disappointed sometimes because they do all this math and they have to do all this, this, this data science work and then there's just a couple lines of code to actually train the model. Because really it's all about data visualization, preparation, extraction, transformation, and loading into their model. And, and that's what's key though, is data scientists we think of as machine learning experts, but really they're using tools and these tools take a huge amount of compute resources. That's where the network engineer and the infrastructure engineer starts to come in, is because these are statisticians in our business, in our company, and they're not experts at using massive amounts of resources or distributing those applications. And we can talk more about that, of, of why we want to distribute these applications, but really we've got statisticians that have been sitting in a business office and they're asked to solve a business problem and they're using the tools that are new to them and they're still using a lot of their traditional foundational knowledge of how to, how to consume and digest and get value or extract insights from data. And machine learning just happens to be one of those new tools at their disposal. So let me, let me summarize what we've, done, we've covered so far. So we've got in the machine learning bucket. So machine learning is about kind of building a model. This is kind of the output of the machine learning exercise that is capable of, of deducing or inferring some answer based on some unknown data that comes in. The construction of that model starts with training because we end up, we, we, we've got that child code, right? It doesn't know anything yet. We have to give it a bunch of material that we know the answer to, right? Those are those tagged pieces of material. And so that it can learn what's a cat, what's a dog, all of these different pieces. And then the output of the training is the model that can be then used to deduce things in the future. So we've got those. And then I imagine over time, even once you've got your model created, you'd be retraining and updating so that it becomes more and more accurate over time as it goes through. Absolutely, that, yeah. and, and, and now you, you've, you've absolutely got it right. Now we get to uh, another kind of complexity that you just mentioned, and that is once I've got that model, that model is, is just this tiny little algorithm, 
And, and sometimes they're huge, sometimes they're small, but they, they can now run on a mobile device. They can go get shipped out to the edge where they're maybe near an IoT device or an IoT source of data and, may, and start making, excuse me, decisions about processing or inferencing at the edge. Sometimes they're video models. So they're, if they're parsing real-time video, those models might live in a video camera or near a source of video from a number of different sources so it can do real-time video detection. And now we can start to see that inference can start to take some processing requirements and I have to be able to distribute these models out to different application components and infrastructure components. And again, these are statisticians who are not used to web scale applications or deploying applications or managing or monitoring applications. And I might even want to retrain that model at some point, send it back to my data center where I have some huge compute workloads and then retrain it and then redistribute it. And that's this new term called online ML where we're constantly retraining these models so that the inference that's happening at the edge is the latest data. And if my, if, if my predictions somehow are not accurate anymore, I take my latest data, retrain that central model, and then redistribute out my new updated model to do the latest and greatest inference. And this becomes pretty complex, and this is very much like how network engineers and infrastructure engineers help DevOps or, or application engineers think about how do I architect and deploy their applications? What are the, what are the uh, kind of infrastructure pieces that I might need? Where are the areas that I might apply IT governance? Um, mm -hmm. Interesting kind of, we, we, we've talked about this in the past, but you know, 80 plus percent of machine learning is, is and training is happening on-prem. And that's because of this data gravity. And so if I've got this kind of online ML cycle happening, well, I can't constantly go back to some data, uh, some some public cloud provider, or somewhere where my data doesn't reside, because I'm actually shipping that model to multiple public clouds, to my SaaS offered solutions, or my my business intelligence or ERP systems, as well as other private data centers or my own infrastructure. And so, if I have all that centralized data in my own infrastructure, we have this concept of data gravity, where I start to pull the processing there. But what's interesting is most machine learning, while it's happening on-prem, is not happening in the data center. Because again, we go back to statisticians, they go, oh man, I've got to train this model. So they go build a $20,000 desktop machine with a bunch of consumer GPUs, and they stick it under their desk without a surge protector, without backups, without IT security, without you know um, uh, any sort of IT governance. And, and now we, they are not only missing out on the performance, but they're putting the business at risk. And they're actually losing out on a bunch of performance because the data is not sitting in their office in the you know in their line of business. It's sitting in the data center. So if they could actually process the machine learning next to the data, they get a huge performance increase as well. And and that's certainly I think Cisco's big focus is how can we help bridge this gap so that our infrastructure and network engineers can help the the data scientists in or in our customers organizations get more value out of the processing of their data. So as we kind of get into some of those pieces, so I think I have a good understanding of kind of where artificial intelligence and machine learning is. It seems like machine learning is the part that's actually more interesting than the artificial intelligence. That's where the, the value is that goes through. And as we, we translate into some of the infrastructure pieces, you've mentioned GPUs a couple of times. And, and I know that's one of the areas that Cisco's ah, we've got some, some specific UCS hardware that's got GPUs in it for machine learning. What's the deal with GPUs? I mean, I, I got in, interested in GPUs back in when I was younger and I would build a machine to play a first person shooter. I wanted a fast GPU for fast frame rates and so no lag. When did GPUs become important for training data? I mean, how does how do these two things relate together? Yeah, so I mean, obviously we had all these consumer video cards that, that people were playing video games on and they were designed for shading and rendering all these points in space at time, all simultaneously. And they could take hundreds or thousands of points of data and process them simultaneously. So it was more about throughput than it was about actual IOPS, the number of cycles that the, the silicon could do. And so some very intelligent uh, you know, uh, uh, folks in academia figured out that they could actually use that higher throughput for machine learning and so some of the frameworks that are, are out there were optimized for GPUs. And, and that, that was great. We saw this huge uptick and people were using kind of consumer grade CPUs to get a, a higher level performance. 
But then NVIDIA came and said, let's build GPUs that actually have optimizations for machine learning algorithms and these frameworks, these black box frameworks, to let them iterate faster in silicon. And so they actually worked with the library vendors and actually designed silicon that's optimized for those libraries and then released all the different things that software developers need, like all the connections these frameworks can leverage so that you can compile these, these, these individual frameworks like TensorFlow or Theano or Cafe into the optimized form for every single individual type of GPU that they, that they, they release. Um, and they came out with data center formats, form factors. So for instance, um, Cisco's C480 ML has uh, eight V100s. And eight V100, the eight V100s can give uh, you know, about 10,000 times the, the consumption workload of a, of a uh, consumer graphics card. So uh, quite a bit of sure, use so there from the, from the GPU side. Excellent. So before we, we dive into some of the, the Cisco work that's in there, I think you've, you've prepped us a demo real quick. So can you give us kind of a short example of how some of these, these concepts that we've, we've talked about? So where does training fit in? How do these things function and work for us? Absolutely. So I'm going to give a high level just kind of uh, overview of machine learning. And, and one of the, the kind of hello worlds of machine learning, and especially image recognition and, and kind of computer visualization, is the MNIST database. MNIST database is a kind of this abbreviated database of, of handwritten digits. And so, so the images, the 60,000 images, are the inputs. They are the, the features that our model would use. And then they're all labeled. So the image of a zero says it's a zero. The image of a five says it's a five. So I have all this data that I can actually use to train a, a model and it's been very useful because as we've been working and building and trying to improve computer visualization and, and really machine learning in general, this has become kind of a benchmark. And it used to take months to train when this data set was first released on some of the best models out there. Well, now I want to show you an open source demo from Stanford here that can actually train real time. I'm going to start passing in hundreds of these examples to a model. And you can see that the loss, this is the accuracy of my model, is continually improving. So I'm training that model right now. So a model just doesn't say, I'm trained. It actually constantly improves in performance. Now, you eventually get to a point where you don't get any improvement by continuing to iterate. But these iterations, you'll continue to improve and you'll see a little bit of variation there. And eventually you'll get to a highly performant model and we can actually even see the visualizations that are being passed into that model as the input features, and they're all being labeled. So we can see how we're breaking these up into different pixelated forms or grayscale forms, and we're creating this highly accurate model purely by iteration. Now that's happening in my browser. That's partly due to the increase in computation power that we've all gotten, but that's also due to the fact that these, these frameworks how they iterate and the math behind them has greatly improved during this time. So MNIST is very, very important. Now, yeah, go ahead. So real, real quick on this. So I think this is a really good example of kind of how the machine learning process works. So we started out with, with a bit of code running in your browser that had no idea what the difference between a three and a six and a seven were. And then we started passing through, and in this case you sent it 6,000 examples of digits. And the first one, it made a really bad guess but then it looked at what the answer was and tweaked itself. And so that's where that graph that you're, you, we see on the screen, that's its accuracy getting better. And so that's machine learning is it starts out really bad at it, but every time it's able to check and say, oh, it, it, made, an, it made a guess, the algorithm was right or wrong, it kind of gets better as it goes through. This case is for digits, but, but any type of data could go through this. We just need some, something that's a known quantity that can, can be kind of tuned through these different black box algorithms that we consume, correct? Yeah. Absolutely. And as the number of, here we only have 10 options, right? Zero through nine. So from mm -hmm. our classification problem, it's pretty small because now we think about real time video analytics. I show a Google, you know, uh, uh, image utility. It's trying to detect one out of every object in the world, right? So it's not just 10 buckets, it's a billion buckets. So training those models takes years. 
And so really it's all about iteration. The concept is the same. The frameworks are the same. Mm -hmm. It's all about those random natures and finding the best output of those natures. Um, so once we have the model, what can we do with it? Well, so now we need to go and do inference with that model. And here's another demo using that, that model. So I'm gonna just gonna draw a, a number here and it's gonna pass it into a couple different trained models. And there I can see the confidence rating for each number. Now this is important because just like a human, I might say, we don't, if I were to write this as a switch statement, right? If this were a if else statement, it's 100% one way and definitely not another, and it will always be that same way. Well, here we can actually see a confidence rating. We can see where it's 97% sure that this is a three, which equates in the human world to pretty, it's, it's a three, right? Um, or at least it looks like one. And so this is pretty important because we can actually use this of, of if it's not confident in anything, we know it's somewhere right in the middle. And that happens in machine learning where it's, it doesn't always have the chance to tell us and maybe we need to handle that. So it's, it's interesting on this. So it's one of the things that I look at is we've all been seeing these CAPTCHA things because it's supposedly the CAPTCHA being able to like read these numbers that are buried in is something only a human can do. But but clearly we've kind of gotten beyond it. So uh, as these things go through. Well, and that's part of the reason not only was CAPTCHA used for by Google and, and others to, to train machine learning models. When you click and type in those numbers, you're actually training a model. You are labeling a data set for them that they then use to train a model. Um, we're now doing that with pictures of street signs and cars. And I find it funny, we're spending time justifying that we're human to help train a machine, act like a human. Um, so, <laughs> and, and to your point, it's always gonna be an arms race. And, and uh, the, yeah. those machine learning models are gonna continue to, to be, once they're, once they're easy to solve like this, numbers, um, then they have to move on to something more advanced to, to prove that you're human. So now that we've seen this, let's, let's kind of translate this into where does Cisco play and, and where does it go through? So as we dive this into infrastructure pieces and these different components, like how do we take this and translate it into where Cisco fits? Yeah, so you know, this is all kind of abstract in the sense of, of somebody, you know, we are using this framework to, to train this model and, and build this outcome to be able to do inference, but a data scientist is gonna use a tool called Jupyter Notebook. And, and so I actually just have like a, a little example here. I'm gonna show you this. I'm gonna launch this and, and this is just a little web-based tool that a data scientist would come in and they create these notebooks. And this is where they actually do the, the, the statistician's analysis. And the, it's actually here in Python and I can inter, interlace not just code, but I can actually also interlace, um, let me uh, clear my uh, output here. That's fine, we'll, we'll just leave it as is. Um, so I can interlace these code and these images and, and different types of code statements and run blocks, which is pretty powerful. Um, something that's starting to take place, not just, outside, not just in data science, but you know, network engineers and others find a lot of value in using Jupyter Notebooks to share blocks and samples of code because I can really easily explain how I do this. Um, and, and in this first statement here, I'm just gonna import this TensorFlow library. So I'll click run. And it's going to inset, you see this little one down here, meaning it ran, and it says module not found. Well, that's because I'm on a MacBook right now, and I'm running this from my, my web browser. Well, TensorFlow has to be compiled specifically for the type of machine and GPU and CPU that it's on. And that can be pretty complex. So usually, a data scientist will spend a lot of time compiling these tools specifically for the one hardware platform that they want to do all their training on. Well, what if I have to do training in my data center or in a cloud provider or across multiple different environments or I wanna do inference of that model, I wanna distribute that model. And that's where Google started saying, well, we have all this great work in container orchestration in Kubernetes. TensorFlow is our machine learning format. We should be putting that into Kubernetes and that's called Kubeflow. And Cisco's a big supporter of that. And really, one of the biggest ways we support that is through the Cisco Container Platform with our partnership with NVIDIA for dedicated hardware, but also for data scientists people to use Kubeflow. Cisco is one of the biggest, is the biggest contributor other than Google to the Kubeflow project right now. So we're huge supporters of these open source projects. And really quickly, I'll just show you what that looks like. So if I go to another uh, uh, terminal here, I'm just gonna show that I've got a, uh, you don't have to worry about um, knowing Kubernetes at all, um, but I will just show that I've got a, 
a number of pods running. And these are just individual containers that were deployed to my Kubernetes instance to have a Kubeflow instance. And one of these is, is my TensorFlow hub here. And so if I go to my TensorFlow hub, this is actually just running in a container here. Um, this is my Jupyter hub here. This is running in my TensorFlow or in my Kubernetes instance. And so my Kubernetes container has this Jupyter instance and I can come in as a data scientist and choose, all right, I wanna run a TensorFlow uh, uh, image. I wanna give it you know, one CPU and one gig of RAM. Maybe I wanna allocate a certain number of my NVIDIA GPUs. I click spawn. And now if I come back to list these pods, you'll notice it launched a Jupyter admin and it's creating that container right now. A data scientist only has to know how to administer this and based on the resources they selected, if they selected five GPUs, it's gonna go out and look at my Kubernetes cluster and find where those five GPUs are available and place that resource where they need it to run. And now they have access to a Jupyter notebook with all the tools needed compiled specifically for that instance and dynamically running wherever they need it to run. This is huge because as we talked about with online ML and some of this ongoing need to spin up the, the ability to train models and spin those down as quickly as possible, as well as do inference, Kubeflow uses Kubernetes to automate that process and data scientists can just work in the tools that they need to in, in the Jupyter instance. So this is one of many ways that Cisco is helping to drive the ability for our customers to get value from Cisco hardware to be intrinsically part of their AIML pipeline, whether it's on-premise or, or, or in a hybrid cloud nature, all through Cisco Container Platform, Kubernetes, and Kubeflow. All right, so, so let me kind of summarize that piece as we've gone through, because we've seen a bunch of stuff. So we, we started out looking at how we use machine learning algorithms, these different black boxes, and, and as you pointed out, the, the algorithm has to run someplace and these things are being kind of, are, are, it sounds like the, the algorithms are tightly coupled to the platform they're running on. And so that was the whole idea that they build this custom box that sits, sits under their desk. But from a, a scaling perspective and taking away the requirements for the data scientists to like snap together all this hardware, one of the areas Cisco is working on is kind of providing a packaged platform so the data scientists can just kind of consume these algorithms on hardware that's ready to go and they can they can scale it out and use them as shared resources. So I, I think that's interesting um, and kind of shows that element of, of Cisco's infrastructure to support machine learning initiatives within other customers' areas. But where does, where does machine learning and artificial intelligence kind of fit into the Cisco networking portfolio? Like, how are we using it not to not to provide machine learning platforms for people to buy, but kind of as a consumer of machine learning ourselves? Like, where is this popping up across our portfolio? Yeah, so our customers are not the only ones that want to put to get analytics or get insights from their data to improve their products or improve their offering to their customers. We do it ourselves. And so we've used these types of tools in our own data centers to train models. And those models do inference in our products. So we think one of the best examples is in encrypted traffic analytics or ETA. ETA actually looks at all the stream of network traffic coming into your network device at the edge and says, I've got all this encrypted traffic. I can't see the network traffic, but the pattern, the rate at which they come in, the source address, all this in individual data that we have, the, 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 uh, the net, uh, the, the telemetry data that we have from those, those streams, all of that NetFlow data and, and the information about that encrypted traffic, those are features. And we use a, a machine learning model that Cisco built and it is trained from all of our global knowledge to actually predict with 99.8% accuracy to infer inside the networking device whether or not traffic that's passing through it is currently malicious. Now we, we, we showed this off at, at Barce uh, uh, Mobile World Congress last year in Barcelona and found over 300 million malicious events inside encrypted traffic while preserving the privacy of those individuals. And we can now start to block those things. We are also not just shipping these as global, you know, uh, universal algorithms. They're being retrained and modeled within the Cisco products in a customer's environment with the data from the customer's environment. So DNA Center 
and tetration analytics both can find exceptions to data or find um, um, exceptions in performance that might impact or predict maintenance that needs to happen within your data center. We can start to predict when a con route convergence or when a hardware failure is going to happen or even when we can start to detect trends globally and alert customers that a DDoS attack may be coming and we do that with things like Talos in combination with all of our other security portfolio. So we're using these machine learning portfolios or, or, or algorithms, these trained models to infer all the data we get from networking traffic. We also use it in our security portfolio, but we also are using it in things like our collaboration portfolio. So our room-based systems all have a NVIDIA Jetson GPU and they're doing real-time inference to actually go and look at the video streams that are happening, coming from our video systems. And the, that real-time inference is actually letting us know how many people are in the room, is Casey in the room, did Casey attend? You're starting to see name tags. We're actually pulling and training data from your corporate directory and training that specific to a customer's environment so we can actually predict who's in the meeting, who's not based on facial analytics, do some people counting, some stuff there as well. Um, and then AppDynamics. AppDynamics actually monitors the health of your application. So machine learning, being used to actually predict whether or not the performance of your application is, is gonna change or not. So it's buried throughout our portfolio. Sure, so, so let me, let me I, and that was a great overview of kind of, kind of all of the different areas that Cisco's going. So I wanna, I wanna drive back in and make sure I, I understood kind of and pull these pieces together. So in, ETA, encrypted traffic analytics, and so the idea here is it's, it's an element that's been baked into our, our infrastructure that can look at patterns inside of traffic, telemetry traffic, so these are headers, fragment sizes, types of those pieces, and then make best guesses about which types of traffic are, are, are malicious. And the way that this worked is we had a bunch of data that we knew. We had some, some known quantity pieces and we were able to, to run that through a black box algorithm that Cisco built to kind of make this identification to learn as it goes through. And so again, it all started with a set of known data that built a trained model, and then that model gets kind of distributed out into the infrastructure that can then monitor real-time traffic going through and look for patterns that kind of trigger off that model or, or, or over some sort of a threshold that says, hey, this is, this is malicious as it goes in. And then as that data keeps going through, we can continue to make these models better. So that was the ETA one. We see similar things with uh, Tetration and Stealthwatch and these other areas. And then, yeah, one of the, the interesting ones, and probably the first place I noticed some of the machine learning from Cisco was in the collaboration portfolio with face tracking and all these other pieces. And just kind of seeing how machine learning and artificial intelligence are just popping up as elements that are, that are all over the place as it goes in. And so, so with that, I want to kind of transition us into kind of the second, the, the, the end session of where we're in. And kind of how does machine learning and artificial intelligence fit into the network engineer, the infrastructure's engineer job? So are we going to be building machine learning systems? Like, are we going to expect, are we already are expecting network engineers to learn some Python, learn some APIs, do some network automation. Are we now also going to expect them to be building and using TensorFlow and go through on that? I mean, is this, is this an expected part of what's going to come into the network engineer's kind of daily routine? So I would say no. I think, I think it's very much like the application development cycle where we expect network engineers and infrastructure engineers to understand things like containers and modern deployment practices and DevOps and things like uh, maybe I have SSL offloading or reverse proxy or I have these different kind of constructs that are part of my infrastructure that I have to manage and implement for my application development team. And I have to be able to speak the same language as my app devs, the people who are writing the applications in my enterprise, and the people that I'm trying to service and build and host infrastructure for. I, we have to all speak the same language, but I'm not the one coding the application as the network and in, in infrastructure engineer. I'm not writing the business applications. I might be writing applications to manage the network or to be you know, in the mm -hmm. DevOps cycle. But really what we really want people to do is have a, a, a common language, an understanding of these are the outcomes that application developers are trying to deliver. And they're not really just shadow IT. They're actually just trying to iterate and be agile. And it's the same thing with data scientists. They're not trying to hide from IT with a big box under their desk. They might be a little bit afraid of if you go and move their workloads to the data center that they lose productivity. And that's really what we're trying to help our infrastructure and network engineers understand is that this machine learning growth 
is just getting started. Ex uh, you know, it, it's going to be exponential over the next, you know, multiple, it, it's going to be exponential, right, is it, it, for, for the long term. And we know that our, our customers are going to be spending a lot or a large amount of money in this space and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of resources and time. And we want to help our customers get the most value out of those investments that they make. To do that, we have to be able to speak the same language. I have to be able to understand that a data scientist wants to train a model and that they're going to need a lot of compute resources for that. I need to understand that they're going to have to do inference or prediction, and that's going to happen at a different place, and they're going to need to distribute that. I'm going to have to help them get access to those resources with GPUs and some of those conversations. And I need to help, help, help them understand that we have an understanding of and, and can speak that common language so we can help them solve some of those problems. So I would say for network and infrastructure engineers, you, you can certainly go down that route. And I think everybody's picking some specialization to spend more time in and, and get more invested in. But for, for the majority of our network engineers out in our customers and within Cisco, I wouldn't expect them to be data scientists or machine learning experts. What we really want to get to is, is that level where they understand how to help customers get value out of our data center solutions and our network solutions, how we can help explain how machine learning functions in our own products, and then even lastly, how we can give data to the data scientists at our customers. It's an area we didn't talk about yet, and that is that we have data coming not just from the network telemetry and all these other events, but we have data from our application health monitoring, from our security systems, from our collaboration portfolio, from our IoT portfolio, wireless location analytics, right? The data scientists, if they knew the type of data they can get from their Cisco investments, can start to get other types of value in their enterprise and other types of inferences that they can use throughout their ecosystem as well. So really, we just wanna be able to have our network engineers understand how Cisco is helping the data scientist, how we're baking some of those solutions into our own products to get those outcomes, and then how data from all of our Cisco ecosystem can be valuable to enterprises as well. So one of, is, and that makes sense. And I think understanding how these things fit in and, and how we can provide back, it actually reminds me of a, a similar type of a um, kind of a domain of area, which is the, that we ran into uh, same types of conversations, which was the big data, right? A couple of years ago, Hadoop was the huge thing and every, every organization and, and all across the board, we were trying to figure out how do we support Hadoop and there were, there were yellow elephants popping up all over people's desks as they go through. It seems really similar to this type of thing with machine learning and, and big data and then even kind of high performance computing pieces. And so maybe as we, we finish up here too, how does, how does machine learning fit in with big data and high performance compute? Are these just the next evolution of the same thing or are these, are these separate things? So I would say it's the next evolution of, of, of that similar thing, but it, it's almost bringing all compute platforms up to the high performance compute spectrum where you're gonna see Cisco, not only with the C4 ADML, but other investments in our UCS infrastructure portfolio, go more into that high performance compute space because that's really where most of our customers are starting to head, is that they are getting into this exponential compute space. But we're getting people using these systems and having access to these systems that, that haven't had data center infrastructure experience or haven't had big data compute experience. And they are still, a lot of these libraries are natively supporting things like Hadoop or Elasticsearch or, or different types of big data platforms or data lakes to do that ETL workload to actually extract and transform and load the data to be able to train itself. And so it is intrinsically part of that same solution that we do still need those big data solutions to be able to query and pull the data into that training model to build that model. So it's still one and the same, and, and, and certainly the, the platforms that were needed for that are, are still needed going forward. Great. So one last question before we kind of summarize and finish up here. So so what you're, it seems like you're saying is I shouldn't expect as a network engineer to be going to write a bunch of machine learning pieces to parse my, my network logs. Is, is that the case here? Is that's not my future? You know, I think I, I am in our ecosystem growth space and we have a lot of third party vendors that are using our APIs and our telemetry to build those solutions for you. Um, you know, uh, Cloudera and, and Anaconda Enterprise and Abbey Networks all use machine learning to kind of get, take the data from Cisco telemetry and add these additional values. Cisco is adding that value for you as well. It's not to say you shouldn't do that. 
But what the foundational element is more important, that we understand how to talk and benefit data scientists, that we understand that that's going to be our responsibility as network and infrastructure engineers to help them have access to all the resources. That's our primary goal. And then secondarily, we do have, we are open, going to be open sourcing a lot of networking train, training data source, uh, sources for data scientists that are interested in, in the networking space and solving some of these networking problems um, and, and some tools in the future to make that easier. But I think to your point, absolutely, we, we, we would say the average engineer is, is really going to be giving that value of helping architect the business solution with the data scientists to make the inferences on, the, on that data. That makes sense. We've got plenty of other tools we can use to parse our syslog data these days. We didn't need to learn a new one anyway, so I think that's good. All right, so let's let's kind of bring us to the end here. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing our slides again here as we kind of finish this up. So let me grab it. Okay. All right. So as these come up, first, Casey, I really want to thank you for joining me today. This has been a really interesting dialogue as we've gone in. I know I'm coming out of the other side of this better understanding what uh, machine learning is, what um, artificial intelligence is, how they relate, um, some of the different use cases that go through in the space, and then where Cisco fits in. So I, I think that that's, that's been hugely valuable as, as we've seen that one go in um, on that side. Now, as a reminder, some of the, the different pieces that we talked about inside of our session today is we started out with kind of a look at the fundamentals of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so again, artificial intelligence is the kind of the act of building some bit of code to try to replicate some aspect of human nature, human process and thought. But the really big money maker that's, that's in here is the machine learning part, this ability to kind of build self-learning algorithms and kind of teach them to become better at making predictions, inferring information based on kind of the results of some known data set that goes in. We talked about some of Cisco's interest. I was excited and honestly completely surprised to learn that we are behind Google, the number one contributor to Kubeflow, which is that architecture where we're figuring out how do we take the machine learning workloads and put them into kind of a structured, scalable um, Kubernetes style platform so that we get kind of the workloads out from underneath the desks inside of our data scientists cubicles as they go through. And then this relevance to network infrastructure, similar to what we saw with big data, similar to what we've seen with some of the high performance computing in other areas, understanding machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to be critical for all of us because we need to help support these inside of our organizations. But thankfully, or at least thankfully for me, it's not one more thing I need to learn how to go do myself. I'm probably not going to be doing machine learning on my own, though I will be consuming elements of machine learning from things like enhanced threat analytics and tetration and kind of understanding more about kind of where this magic happens inside the black box, I think is going to be hugely valuable for all of us. Now, there are some resources we've pulled together. So if you want to dive deeper in, you want to kind of peel the layers back, see what's out there, we do have an artificial intelligence and machine learning page up on DevNet, so developer.cisco.com slash AI. And you can find details about some of those hardware platforms that we've provided and some of the information to kind of bring machine learning capabilities into organizations to support those data sciences workloads. We've got some blogs that are out there as well. And then we've got some learning labs. Um, similar to what, what Casey mentioned, we, we aren't necessarily all of us building software applications to go in containers, but I'm a big fan of saying, you know what, understanding the fundamentals of how Docker works or understanding the fundamentals of how Kubernetes work will help us build networks around those. And I think the same thing goes for machine learning. So take a look at the Intro to Machine Learning Learning Lab or the Cisco Container Platform, which is our ability to kind of make it easy to bring these Kubernetes environments inside your data center and then connect that to hybrid cloud locations that are there. And from a sandbox perspective, we do have some hardware coming in. So if you want to get hands on with some of these new machine learning GPU enabled UCS platforms, keep an eye out for in our sandbox for these resources to become available as you go through. Now today is our kind of the end of season one for Net DevOps Live. We will be back with season two with all new episodes. But in the meantime, be sure to check out all of the elements of Net DevOps up on DevNet. We've got all of the past episodes from season one. So if there's one that you didn't make live or you haven't caught the recording, those are all posted. Or if there's something you want to revisit and dive deeper into, maybe the Python uh, libraries for network engineers or the ACI and Kubernetes as we go through, we've got all of those resources are available on demand up on DevNet as well. 
And so as we come kind of to the end of this, thank everybody so much for joining us in tonight's discussion in this interview style around machine learning and artificial intelligence. And Casey, again, thank you so much for joining. This has been an excellent dialogue as we go in, and I think that there's plenty of other areas for us to go through. Any final thoughts for the, uh, the folks out there? You know, no, just thanks for having me, Hank. I think this series has been a ton of fun to watch, and this has been a, a great first season, and looking forward to season two. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and we will talk to you again soon. Bye.